Good evening. You're joining us live on Facebook for this month's episode of Science Stream. Welcome. We'll be starting our broadcast in a bit. Meanwhile, please make yourself comfortable. If you have any questions for our guests, please leave them in the comment section. See you shortly. Hello once again, especially to those who have just joined us. I'm Sean from Techno Penang, Penang's very own Science Discovery Center. Augmented reality and virtual reality are immersive technologies that bring new dimensions and perspectives to storytelling and how we do things. Besides entertainment, the use of AR and VR is becoming more common, ranging from social media, e-commerce, education, manufacturing, and many more. With the rise of Industry 4.0 and accompanying new technologies, AR and VR have improved a lot and will help shape the future of our world. The adoption of AR and VR will be accelerated further with the current pandemic, where many are working and studying remotely for the possible future. Ms. Ong, the Chief Technology Officer of NeeBooks, will tell us more about augmented and virtual realities in this month's science stream. Louis hails from Penang, which he sees as Malaysia's center of gravity in hardware and software engineering. Holding a diploma in electronics engineering, a conversation with him will surely involve him diving into the latest technology and his admiration of all things drones and robotics. After serving for a few years in the drone industry, Louis believes that augmented reality and virtual reality may be the key to create public awareness on emerging technologies such as drones before they are being mass commercialized. As such, Louis jumped on the AR VR bandwagon and currently serves as CTO of NeeBooks, which he leads the technical decision of the NeeBooks app, an award-winning mobile app with patented technology that allows the reader to personalize how their favorite books in a unique way. Please join me to welcome Luis to the show. Hi, good evening, Sean. So, Hi, good evening. Welcome to Science Stream. Yeah, I'm Luis uh, from eBooks itself. And firstly, I would like to say that I'm very humbled to be able to be invited um, to be part of uh, the program of TechToom itself. And I'm myself itself from Penang and is really inspired about what TechToom is currently doing in order to inspire uh, future kids, uh, kids about the future knowledge that uh, is important to us to the industry 4.0. Thank you for spending time uh, tonight to do that. So yep. tell us more about uh, MeBooks and what is your role as the CTO at MeBooks? All right. So MeBooks is an interactive children audiobook that is inspired uh, to that's crafted in order to inspire more storytellers and to improve children literacy. So um, my role currently uh, as CTO is to lead more in terms of day-to-day -day technical operations, um, more a little bit side of management staff, um, and I to steer code as well um, on the MeBooks app. So originally, MeBooks is uh, founded in around 2013 by uh, two founders in UK. So um, 
the, those two founders has built um, what we call it as the Omi books itself. So which uh, comes together with a lot of audiobooks or uh, contents from Oxford. And uh, eventually, those uh, the UK founders company is acquired by a Malaysian company, which is currently us. So and we are currently developing our new app and which has been launched uh, throughout worldwide. So, so um, probably uh, since right now I'm talking a bit abstract, I will probably share my screen right now. So at least I can have a bit visualization on it. All right, hold on for one second. All right, so again, itself, um, MeBooks is an children interactive audiobook that is crafted to inspire more storytellers, and we want to improve children literacy itself. And we find we self uh, stand by believing in our children itself, that our children will be the key to this to the future. Right. So when we crafted Maybooks, we want we always have three philosophies in mind, which are accessible, affordable, and enjoyable, right? Because uh, we want to make it uh, available towards for every child or every day across towards the globe. And uh, our app itself is uh, previously rec uh, currently recommended by a uh, UK for National Literary Trust, which uh, currently suits with our philosophy of we want to improve uh, children literacy, right? As we have uh, into a wonderful of children books with rich immersive audio, and which our um, main unique feature is where comes from our uh, draw and record feature, where the kids is able to draw and trace and then record yourself. So like for instance, uh, based on in the picture itself, um, you can see there are some narrated words itself. So the kids are able to record their words inside the book so they can craft um, what they want. So, and the second thing that we would also like the kid to learn is also about folly engineering, right? So um, take into a look into like, for instance, cinema movies, right? Like let's say Transformers scene and so on. So those movies are created by using CGI. However, the audio that they, uh, they are portrayed inside the movie are all recorded inside a studio, right? Inside a recording studio. And we want kids, besides from learning book itself, uh, would also learn about that, right? Like for instance, today, uh, the books has some um, natural elements like birds, right? So we want them to go out, record how the bird sounds, right? And so on. So this kind this is kind of our philosophy where we um interact together with digital and tactile stuff on it. All right. <clears throat> so um our app is currently available in App Store and Google Play and um currently is being enjoyed by millions of families and we have a, a few signatures voices like for instance Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch uh, who actually uh currently acting as Doctor Strange and uh, we have David Jason and so on and so on itself, which I will show more uh, in the next few slides, right? So in our content itself, uh, currently consists of around 400 plus titles and mainly ranging uh, from Oxford uh, towards to Asian contents and we have uh, a few other uh, we own publishers inside, right? So like for instance, uh, these are some of the Oxford books. So where... Um, some of it has a certain reading levels. So because uh, in Oxford itself, they divide certain reading levels tiers in order for kids to pick up uh, English uh, specifically uh, easily. So there's a reading level one that is suited for, let's say, those that are starting going to learn English for preschool, etc. Um, and on our side itself, we are also trying to um, improve by uh, me books by adding more Asian content as we hope to increase uh, more Asian users uh, etc best uh, we want to develop localized content right so uh, this is these are some of the con contents currently available inside and uh, back to just now itself uh, these are some of a lot of we own um, narrators that actually narrate for uh, our books inside me books and uh, this is some of our global coverage, which I'll skip for now. And just to summarize again, so this is our, uh, this me books again. So we have currently around over 400 children titles and 
we have our our main unique feature is our that we allow kids to actually draw and record their sound. So because we want to inspire more storyteller, and we also want them to improve uh, literacy at the meantime. And over here, some of our uh, features that we add on currently is where we have rewards and achievement system, we have voiceover and reading progress tracking and so on. And um, currently, we also are trying uh, to improve me books by doing some r d right which um current uh previously uh, my role in, in as cto is also try to find new technologies that is exciting and is suited to our vision as well uh to in order to combine it in our new me books app right so that's why uh, we also find ar and vr quite interesting to be uh placed inside me books as one of the main feature Right, so this is why um, we currently do some partnerships together with Unisys, etc. All right, and these are some of our existing partners, which I'm going to skip, um, and some of our pillars, and um, right, yeah, and that's uh, currently the end of my slide. But before I want to end on it, so because uh, just some icebreaker stuff, uh, as today is talking about uh, AR and VR, so I would like to give uh some sneak peek about what is AR actually, right? Because I think uh, if there is any audience that don't know what AR is, right? So they can view this in order to understand about AR right away, right? So right now over here, we can see this demo itself, uh, right? So over here, this is uh, a Mac screen, uh, and then inside here, there is uh, an iPhone, right? So let's say today, uh, and uh, a user, right, wants to buy an iPhone. So when they just point their camera towards to this iPhone, and then this thing pops up, right? Which is an adds up kind of interactive content over here, which they are able to scale up and scale down the size of iPhone to view in more clearly, right? So this is uh, for one example itself, which is about what is AR is. And the second thing uh, that I want to show about what is AR is, is also about uh, what we call it as a kind of markerless feature in AR. So over here, they are able to place an iPhone, right? So let's say they can place again, right? So, and then when they move their camera away, sorry, when they move their camera away, they are still able to view the iPhone over here, right? So this is um, some of the examples of AR, which uh, I will definitely talk more later. Uh, Yes, uh, together with Sean on this. Yeah. So, uh, like you mentioned, uh, the markerless one. Okay, so, the yes, already evolved through the years. Previously, you need a marker, then only the thing can work. So, it needs to recognize something, then uh, it will be able to uh, come alive. But now, uh, we do have the markerless ready. Yep. I think um, nowadays technology improves um, a lot itself. Like as you mentioned, purity for marker, marker itself is much more easier, right? Because uh, once the computer just scans this image, it pops up something, right? But for markerless itself, it may be tougher itself. Why is it so? Is because let's say today, um, it's like a human, right? So you place a water bottle in front of you, and right now, let's say you rotate your head to other places, other point of view, right? You still need to remember that your water tumbler is placed at the right side of you. So that is why technology improves by a lot currently, where previously the marker base is kind of just a single point of view. Once you point your camera to other places, you can't see your content anymore, right? But with this technology advancement, when it comes to markerless, it kind of changes um, how we interact as well. And how we think about the future. Right. So, uh, the world of startups is not easy. Uh, about 90% of startups fail. Would you like to share your experience with your own startup and what would you advise those who wish to set up their own startup? Yeah. Um, Hmm, that may be quite a long story, but um, to keep it short itself, um, I think to me personally, myself, I have more startup experience compared to corporate side because I didn't join a corporate so far. So um, I was mainly in a 
electronics or drone background itself, where uh, we fly drones in a palm oil plantation and by capturing all those imagery of palm oil plantation, we are able to use uh, what we call it as AI or deep learning algorithms to predict how many palm oil are there and to predict the amount of fertilizer to be bought over there. So um, after I was in um, drone industry itself, I felt that um, the awareness of drones um, is still quite low itself, right? Like for instance, today, um, if you saw a drone fly, right? You'll be like, um, this drone is going to capture, uh, going to steal my privacy, etc." So there's a lot of uh, misconcept, uh, misconception uh, towards to it. So that is why um, I kind of wanted to explore something which is like in educational field to educate, let's say, public awareness about drones, right, etc. So, and I find um, AR and VR is quite a best way to expose and or create uh, public awareness about this. And um, together, I also joined uh, MeBooks as uh, we also would like kids, which is the future generation itself, to know more about this kind of technology, right? Like for instance, um, in the future, we can create books about let's say technology, right? Like drones, and then they are able to use AR to see a physical size of how a drone looks like, right? And why drone fly this way? Why aeroplane is different than drone, et cetera. So um, yeah, that is pretty much my startup journey itself. And for, for me to actually advise um, other people to set up their startup, I mean, is there any advice on it? I may sound controversial, but I, to me, I think that um, don't try to start a startup if you are not certain about it, right? Why I say it about it is because um, running a startup or running a business is tough, right? It's not um, as state, I mean, as portrayed by uh, marketing or videos, like being an entrepreneur, right? It's, it's wealthy, it's good, etc. right? But to be honest, um, being an entrepreneur or when you're joining a startup itself, it's pretty much just working hard and working smart at the, at the same time. So that's why I would say, don't join a startup if you are not certain enough. Yeah, so sometimes um, you may run into debt and sometimes the journey is tough and you may feel alone. Um, but if you do have the opportunity um, and you are thinking to join a startup itself, um, I would say that the best advice is about solving real world problems. I think that is very important because um, um, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of ideas, but out of all these ideas itself, only let's say 10% or 5% or smaller will work. So like, as you can see, 90% of startups fail, right? So, and a big reason of it is that they are not solving a real world problem. And when it comes to startup itself, you need cash to stay afloat, right? If you can't solve a real problem and people don't pay it, right? When people doesn't pay it and then you can't survive. I think that, that is pretty much the whole chicken and egg of philosophy when it comes to startup. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think that's yeah, all. It is sick. The, first, the number one reason for startups to fail is actually due to um, a mismatch of market demand. And number two is actually uh, lack of funds. They run out of funds. Yep. So like what you rightly say, number one is uh, not meeting what actually the market <laughs> needs. Yep. Like, you're not meeting the, 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 the market needs. I think uh, okay. for this itself, uh, they are like, I think there's a, one very famous uh, startup kind of incubator. Uh, they call it as Y Combinator in the US. So the founder of Y Combinator itself uh, has came out with a 10 list of why startup failed. So, and one of the top reasons as mentioned by Sean itself, uh, which uh, is about the mismatch towards to market demand itself. Like for instance, when you create a product, you need to make sure people want it. I think that is the most important thing. For it. Right, anyway. So before we proceed further, I'm sure you would also like to know the views from our live audience. Okay, so yep. we'll be conducting some polls tonight. And the first poll for tonight is, have you heard about AR and VR? So it's a very easy one. Uh, do you know what AR VR? Have you heard of it? Yes or no, right? So let us know what you think below. And don't worry, no one can see what you have answered, not even us. Okay, so Louise, 
what is the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Yeah, um, to give it in short, right, it's just like, let's say playing a game, right? Um, augmented reality is a third point of view, where virtual reality is a first point of view, right? So to elaborate it, take it like you are currently in a racing game, right? So virtual reality is like you are inside the car, you are looking um, towards to the whole landscape, uh, the whole environment, right? Where the third point of view is like for those gamers itself, you are looking from outside the car, right? Where you can see your whole car on top of this. So um, that is uh, a very abstract, uh, simple kind of layman term itself to actually explain AR is a third point of view or VR is a, is a uh, first point of view, right? So um, to illustrate this uh, furthermore itself, right? So VR can be said as when you are, uh, VR can be said that like you are wearing a goggles. So when you wear this goggles itself, you will be immersed fully inside that you don't care about anything surrounding you, right? So because right now, if I wear, let's say, a goggles itself, so when I wear this goggles, I can't see anything surrounding me myself anymore, right? I will be inside a virtual world. Where um, for AR itself, it's like just now, uh, the example that I've shown, right? So like, for instance, right now, this is a table, right? Or, or let's say uh, this is an empty floor. I haven't buy a furniture, right? So I can use AR to place a sofa just in, in front of this floor to see how it looks like. So there is a, there is a major difference between AR and VR. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm not sure if the audience have a chance to uh, vote it already. Do we have the results from the poll? Okay. All right. So let's see how many of our audience have set of AR and VR. Okay. Uh, okay, this will be a hundred percent yes. So it's good to know that our audience, all of them already know what is AR and VR, uh, or at least heard about it. Okay. Uh, all right. So it's no longer a stranger to our audience, but then it is quite common to hear about AR, VR, like what we see in the audience. But there's an increasing reference to XR. Okay. Uh, what is XR? Right. So for XR itself, uh, it's called as mixed reality, right? So you see AR is called as uh, augmented reality. VR is called as virtual reality, right? So why XR is called as mixed reality, right? But uh, actually XR is very similar. I mean, not uh, very similar. It's exactly MR. So or we call it as mixed reality, just that the X stands for variable, right? For those that uh, study max is uh, something that changes. So um, mixed reality itself is a combination of AR and VR, right? So just now uh, we state about AR is like uh, a third, uh, it's like a third point of view, right? Like for instance, today you want to buy a furniture, you place it just in your world. I mean, in the real world, right? You can see in the real world, you place it so far. VR is like, um, you are immersed inside a virtual world, right? Keywords, one is virtual world and one is a real world, right? Mixed, are, uh, mixed reality stands, uh, aims to actually combine both, right? Like for right now, I wear these glasses, right? So I would like to say that I want to go to Paris right now. So they will bring me to in the virtual Paris world right now, all right? Which is a feature of VR, right? So right now, let's say if I'm bored, I just want to view my um my current world right now, right? But I want to say that, hey, place this sofa, right? On, on my floor, right? But I'm still wearing a glasses and in my glasses itself, I can see there is a virtual sofa placed on my real world. So that is uh, completely a mix between VR and AR. And currently, there are also available devices, uh, which is by Microsoft HoloLens, that uh, they call it as a MR or mixed reality headset on it. So, uh, would you say that this is something similar to what um, you watch in the movies, where you're able to get things done by waving stuff? Uh, okay. I, I think this would be like, Oh, what's that show called? Tom Cruise wearing something, then 
Uh, it, some, it be... um, some sort of like what Iron Man is doing in the movie, right? Ah, uh, okay, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Iron Man right? probably the easier reference. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah. that is that is XR. Yeah, correct. So as long as uh, it is a combination uh, between VR and AR, sometimes you just want to like Iron Man movie, right? So you are just wearing these glasses and you want to say, hey, place all my meeting notes right now in front of me. So you'll place all these meeting notes in front of me, right? But you are still sitting, you are able to look into a desk, right? But let's say if you are bored right now, you want to say, hey, fly me to Paris, right? Into a virtual world of Paris. So yeah, that, that can be said as uh, is a mixed reality on it. <coughs> so would you say that uh, the companies now, they are looking into this, like for example, it's rumored that uh, Apple is looking into Apple glasses. Uh, last time, uh, Google also had theirs, uh, but of course they have very stopped production of that. Uh, I think Facebook is also looking into something similar. So, so would you say that they are trending towards uh, mixed reality? Um, I would say based on um, the current landscape right now, right, it's actually a pro and cons uh, between different reality. As different different technology, right, is suited for a certain niche, right. So, um, for instance itself, uh, let's say for VR, right? If, uh, let's say VR headset right now by Facebook is a class, a class uh, family headset, right? Where for Microsoft itself is a uh, mixed reality and we call it as HoloLens. <coughs> for uh, Facebook uh, headset itself is only able to do for VR, right? But by doing able, by able to do for VR only, the price, is not that expensive compared towards to Microsoft HoloLens itself because the niche of um, Facebook Oculus is for gamers, right? To actually uh, place their headset at home, they just want to have fun, right? In a virtual world itself. Whereas for Microsoft HoloLens itself is catered more in terms of industry applications. Let's say um, for a company to actually educate, let's say um, operators or technicians, right? So instead of they need to manually coach one by one, they can save the cost itself by having a program, a pre-made program itself, where the operators can just wear this, can go to us to, a, let's say it's an electrician, can go to us to a wall, right? And then the mixed reality kind of places what button you need to click, etc. So there is actually a different niche catered to a certain markets. And obviously for uh, classes itself, which is kind of more like AR feature, because it's like you are wearing these glasses and you are overlaying, let's say, your calendar inside, right? So um, Google killed the glasses, seriously. So as actually when it comes to us to building a product itself, sometimes it's also about timing, right? So probably uh, Google Glasses was 2014 and that, that time itself, technology may be uh, quite early so that uh, people can't really adopt it much, right? Like for instance, when iPhone crafted itself, right? Purity is pretty much Blackberry or keypad phones itself. And then when a different kind of, uh, they call it multi-touch technology comes in, and then the timing hits where the market adopts it fastly, right? So um, I think Purity for uh, Google itself, the market does not adopt it because it may be quite early. So, but um, yes, there is quite some rumors itself that Apple is trying to craft out um, their AR glasses, but yeah, they are quite secretive about it. But I mean, personally myself, I'm quite excited to this today because um, technically Apple is trying to integrate um, more uh, AR technology right now. Like for instance, uh, let's say the latest iPhone 12 itself, iPhone Pro Max has LiDAR built in. So which uh, for those that don't know, so LiDAR is like, a technology that's being used in, um, let's say for robots, right? So like for instance, uh, they want to send a mass rover towards to Mars, right? So they need to know about the surrounding itself, which a, a simple camera is not able to um, portray that information, right? Because you want to know the depth, like for instance, how far is this object for you? So that is where um, they call this technology as LiDAR. So they are able to get the whole 3D point cloud. Like for instance, uh, how far is this object uh, behind of me is away, like exactly how many meters, right? So um, so that's why I think I'm quite excited to us to um, what Apple glasses there may be, but, but it's kind of rumor right now. So yeah, who knows? 
Okay. So you mentioned some pros and cons just now. Um, what are the pros and cons of AR and VR uh, that we should know about compared to similar technologies and devices? I think um, for AR itself, right, uh, actually compared to AR and VR, so AR, the, I think the, the main kind of use case that is being used right now is more like um, kind of uh, immersive interactivity. So like for instance, right, let's say uh, today uh, this is a physical book, right? So and then uh, when you want to get more information about it, so there are a lot, a lot of companies right now is doing it where you are able to take, let's say, a tablet and then you just point towards to, let's say, the book, right? So like for instance, this is a book about Galaxy. When you just point on it and then the earth kind of pops up, right? And then it portrays more information. Like for instance, um, uh, how big is the diameter of the earth, etc., which the child is able to interact with it. So um, that is how AR is very commonly being used. But when you do that, right, so um, it's kind of like, uh, let's say you want to interact with a lot of objects, right, you need to hold your, your tablet for quite a while. And then some sort, uh, you, you'll be quite, uh, I think by taking too long, I mean, your energy will also be depleted. <laughs> Out of it, right? So um, that's why compared to us to AR itself, I think similar technology is pretty much uh, some interactive elements that is not uh, kind of AR based. So just like for instance, uh, an interactive book, right? Which uh, what we are doing uh, currently in MeBooks, which we have our interactive uh, page that doesn't our plain old uh, MeBooks app that doesn't come in with AR functionalities, etc. So because um, we have some um, advisors that also talked to us before that um, when we try to add more interactive elements itself, we may kill the child reading experience because a child itself may be too biased towards to interactive elements next time, right, in their career path, etc. So um, learning how to utilize the technology will need to be, we need to be thought of, like really need to think about the implication, etc. So I think the pro and cons about AR is, um, I mean, definitely it brings a lot of information on the table itself instead of, let's say, a book, right? But um, the cons is uh, you are touching a lot of the digital, which you are not touching the physical part on it, right? And for VR itself, uh, the pro definitely is uh, very being used in uh, education. So for instance, um, let's say a doctor, right? Today, uh, they want to... Uh, learn surgery so they may need those uh, simulation tools etc right that may be costly by having a program that is like a surgeon simulator inside a VR headset itself and then they are able to actually uh, learn how do you perform a certain surgery such as certain parts etc right but again I think the cons of VR or AR right um, it's just like a phone right or it's like a social media it's whether Let's say uh, someone, if you are addicted to it, to it by too much, then it kind of um, harms your mental health, physical health, right? It's just like, um, previously, like Facebook, although they did a good job in terms of connecting people, right? Like all of us is able to connect now, one of it is because of social media. But when you are too addictive to it, to it, you are using it day and night, day and night until it harms your sleep schedule and whatsoever, then it's bad. So... The cons of technology is always just about the balance of how do you use it. Yeah. So you, you touched about uh, you know the use in education. So I would like to ask, you know, how effective is it, you know, virtual learning? So now there's a lot of virtual learning. So how effective is virtual learning as compared to in-person and hands-on learning? I personally for myself itself, I'm uh I'm more biased towards to physical learning, like right? able to meet face to face, right? Able to teach you it. So, but uh, because of the current pandemic situation right now, um, we are kind of uh, have to go everything virtual right now. So, um, to me itself, uh, there is a certain pro and cons uh, of virtual learning, where virtual learning is very scalable and is very time saving. So like for instance, everyone has to travel towards to, let's say a school or let's say for adults, right? They, if they want to get courses, right? To upskill themselves, 
they need to travel towards to a training course provider, you know, the training, right? So uh, especially if you live into uh, areas like KL, you are going to start into a traffic jam and you are going past through all the toll, right? Virtual learning helps to solve all of that where you can just, with just one click of a button itself, like I'm currently at my home and all of us are at home and we are able to talk, right? But um, for physical learning is, to me itself, I may still bias towards to it because I felt that um, when it comes to virtual, you can't felt you can't be more emotionally attached to it to that person itself. Like for instance, when I meet with you face to face, right, I'm able to know how do you think of this, right? And because currently when you do virtually, you are only in one point, right? Which is like I can only see this part of you. So yeah, that is um how it how the current situation like, but I believe that in the future technology is going to come in where um, there may be an adoption of VR headset, right? Or AR headset, where you can just have a meeting with right now from someone from different countries right away. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, before we proceed further, we shall now have our second poll night. Uh, so the second poll is, have you experienced? So just now you know, 100% knows about AR VR. So now have they experienced AR VR before? So yes or no? Okay, so click on your choice down below. All right. Um, what you mentioned about, you know, uh, the pandemic. So what, what is AR and VR's role during this pandemic? Is there accelerated adoption of AR and VR during this pandemic? Um, I would say that uh, tackling uh, the, the last question first itself, I would say the adoption itself is definitely accelerated. But um, it may not be as humongous as, um, let's say, others like, uh, let's say, uh, online courses, etc. Right. So um, why uh, I would say that is because that uh, for, let's say, if you just look into Southeast Asia landscape, right. So um, most people just don't have uh, available VR headset. Like even let's say right now, if you want to purchase a class, right, you can't purchase it directly from Facebook because it's not available in uh, Malaysia. Right, so you may need to go through reseller, etc. So that's why um the adoption in Southeast Asia actually we can't see it yet because uh, the adoption is much more clearer when it comes to it to US or uh, Western countries. So um and just by talking besides from talking to VR, <coughs> um talking about AI itself, of uh, I think pretty much for those iPhone users they may see a certain adoptions. So like, for instance, those that uh, play games right now um, in Apple uh, cuts, there are like a ton of games that is utilizing AR functionality. But when it comes to it to Android itself, uh, there's a certain room of improvement of the distribution of Android iOS system. Uh, sorry, Android OS. So why I say so is because uh, for iOS itself, um, in a few, uh, one year, uh, and, uh, iOS iPhone is able to just upgrade your iOS as long as your device is not that old. But for Android itself, uh, it may be quite slow to upgrade it. So that's why for AR itself, it may only be supported by a certain Android phones. But for iPhone itself, uh, technically it's majorly supported since iPhone 6s. So yeah, but don't get me wrong. I'm not like I'm not trying to promote iPhone here or <laughs> Android here. But I'm just trying to say uh, based on. Um, what we see right now. So that's why uh, for AR itself, I think uh, for those uh, people that uh, probably gamers, I think technically they use us um, a lot. So uh, back towards to, yeah, that back towards that is uh, about the adoption itself. So <clears throat> um, by play, seeing how AR and we are playing in the current pandemic role itself, right? I would say pretty much is uh, about education again which um, there are a lot of different products. Like for instance, uh, some of it is a uh, cube where uh, when you just uh, shoot on it and then the cube has different faces where you will portray different information. So there is about AR itself, where for instance, you want to learn an anatomy, right? When you just place a cube itself, it's just showing your heart. So um, back to it, uh, besides from education itself, the second adoption of VR and AR is more about uh, meeting face to face, which is 
the uh, meeting concept, right? So like for instance, uh, in Microsoft HoloLens, you are able to just wear this Microsoft HoloLens and then uh, let's say another colleague of you is wearing the HoloLens as well, right? So you both of you are able to be transported into a room, right? And very similar like Iron Man itself, you are able to place your notes like just in front of, let's say your floor, uh, uh, your wall, etc. So that, that is a certain adoption, but um, just to summarize again, uh, summarize again um, Southeast Asia adoption is pretty much slow, but um, in the Western company itself, uh, Western US countries, yes, uh, it is accelerated for sure. Okay, so let's see if our audience has uh, experienced AR and VR before. Uh, okay, so all of them has, has uh, experienced AR and VR. I think oh. pretty much right for AR itself, um, I, I believe um, most of us use social media like Snapchat, right? Or Facebook nowadays, they have face mm -hmm. filters, right? So technically, mm -hmm. all of them actually uses before. Uh, for VR itself, I think the most common one that I see, uh, although some of, uh, in order to experience VR, you will need a cardboard, right? So where uh, a cardboard actually currently is, uh, you are able to purchase it, it's like, I think 10 to 20 ringgit, where you are able to place your phone inside the cardboard and you are able to view it. So where uh, if you go to your YouTube, there is actually settings like a watch in VR, right? So I think that that is why I think the adoption is actually, uh, I mean, it's been looking quite well. Yeah, so far in, for our audience. Yeah. I, I also remember you, you were saying that, you know, uh, iPhone 6S, I was, I think one of the Apple keynotes, uh, in Tim Cook says that uh, when they were launching something like what one feature, and they say that actually we, we already have one billion uh, uh, AR devices already when they launched that thing because they're able to scale it for all their, their existing devices as well. Yeah, I think there is pretty much uh, a certain role of improvement that uh, we have to be done, but which Android currently is doing that. And I think for for uh, Google itself, they also launched uh, some exciting phones like Google Pixel, which is also aimed towards to improve the quality of Android as Android itself is being made by open source, right? Where for iPhone is much more like closed proprietary. So it's a chicken and egg again, where if you are closed proprietary, you can build, always build the best. But when you are open source, you can always hit a mass market towards to a landscape. So you mentioned Southeast Asia quite uh, quite low la, uh, the adoption. How how bad is it in Malaysia? How how widely is AR and VR used or hardly? I won't say the adoption is bad, right? Because um just by looking at um, just like KL, right, there are a lot of um animation studio. So like for instance, uh, they animate those models that is being used uh, in games, etc. So AR and VR technically is uh, quite adopted uh, because uh, those designers actually uh, create a lot of this kind of AR, VR content. And when it comes to AR and VR, to make it a uh, mass adopted, it's also about content. Content is also a major key when it comes to, us to, the key, uh, to this. Like for instance, for me books itself, right? Today, if we don't have any books, we don't have any content, right? We only have the technology. So that is why content is actually very important if you want to um, adopt a certain things, right? Like for instance, if we um, talk about um, AR and VR content, right? Let's say today this content is a lot about Southeast Asia culture, right? Where kids is able to learn um, by just showing uh, what is actually uh, each tradition of each culture, what is their um, uh, tools, etc. right? So that that content is actually also one of the key but i can't say that the current southeast asia landscape is very bad or whatsoever but i would say that definitely there are people or designers that are creating content out of it so um it's just that uh we current still kind of find a major pain point in terms of why we want to use ar vr right and uh, besides from education right like for instance um you use a phone every day because you want to call, right? You want to uh, socialize in a social network. You want to get updates. That is the major pain point itself. So, but for AR and VR, right now it's being used 
is like a ricochet rational tools, right? Like for instance, you use it just to play games, right? You use it to learn interactively. So that, that is the current adoption. So um, I would say there are definitely 10, 20, or 30% of people that are actually adopting it uh, or even keen to adopting it. Yeah. So you rightly said earlier that AR and VR requires investment in equipment such as goggles and even mobile devices. Not so not like you say Android. Not all mobile device uh, is capable of uh, AR and VR. Uh, yep. So there is also the software. So there are some software that you actually need to not only download for free. You sometimes you need to pay uh, for the content. So will these uh, yeah. hamper those in the rural areas or those that are less fortunate will, will this group of people be left behind if let's just say you know you know they can't afford it or they don't have access to, to these things yeah i think um realistically speaking right um yes they will definitely uh, be left behind just by taking a look in our let's say technologies, right? Common technology, let's say like internet, right? Those that live in the city, we definitely have access to internet first, right? Or even let's say when we are launching 5G, right? Uh, people is, uh, I mean, businesses, right? Are definitely targeting cities because that brings more revenue, right? Those uh, people has more ready available 5G capable smartphones, right? So um, that's why it, um, it's a chicken and egg. Definitely there, they, there will be a certain obstacle in it, but it also depends on initiative uh, of the companies itself, right? Like for instance, if they launch CSR, right, they want to educate uh, people in rural areas, let's say about a certain technology, right? They set up, let's say, uh, an educational center that educates awareness about um, uh, this kind of, uh, I mean, about this kind of technology towards to rural people. But nevertheless, if there is no <coughs> initiative, etc. Um, it's pretty much realistically speaking when it comes to business uh, city will definitely be the major adoption first and eventually things will only slowly catch up towards to them yeah but i believe things will eventually reach them it's just how fast is it right so we we shall have our final poll for tonight not our final question but final poll uh, which do you prefer physical in-person class meeting or online class meeting, right? So you know what to do, click on your preference down below. All right, uh, what can be done to make AR and VR more mainstream then? So you mentioned pain points. How, how do we make this mainstream? Yeah, so based on what I, I mean, based on what I previously stated, I, I'm going to repeat uh, again about two key things. Uh, the first one is about content. So content is the thing that uh, is going to make it mainstream. Just like let's say today you are using uh, your phone. If there is no app as well, so there is no content, right? You may think that the uh, phone is only able to be caught. So AR and VR, I think is the same thing. You will need content itself, which <clears throat> right now itself, uh, big boys, let's say like uh, Facebook, Microsoft, they are acquiring software companies or studio companies in order to build content. So uh, in order to build, uh, in order to make it mainstream, content is the key, right? The second thing, uh, as mentioned, is about pain points, right? So the current pain points that uh, is being adopted is pretty much a lot about education and gaming. Yeah. So to be honest, there is, uh, is pretty much a debate about uh, what AR or VR can solve, etc. But the major things that everyone agrees is uh, technically education, like for instance, uh, uh, companies need to spend, let's say, X amount of resources, right? By using VR, you can uh, pretty much reduce your expenses. And this will encourage, right, businesses to buy. So it depends on the adoption, whether are we going to target B2B or are we going to target B2C, right? So by targeting to B2C itself, really need some some big pain points in order for everyone to use yeah like for instance um uh if you guys saw a movie called as ready player one 
So it's a movie like everyone wears uh, VR guys, uh, goggles, right? And then you are inside a virtual world where um, you are using virtual currency. You are like another one of you, right? So that, that is a B2C market itself. But to build that, um, I would say it need time because those contents has to be built uh, very tediously, right? Like for instance, you see content in uh, the Ready Player One is super detailed and there are a lot, a lot of things inside that. So to really hit a major adoption, uh, you will need time. But uh, in the meantime, what we are currently looking at current landscape right now is good to say that it's being uh, adopted in businesses, right? As it actually reduces their uh, expenses, right? By cutting down a certain uh, cost in training, etc. Right, let's see which, uh, which is our audience preference. Okay, so at least now it's not hundred percent, but still, uh, yeah. a majority prefers uh physical. So uh, one third, one third uh prefers uh virtual, uh two thirds prefer physical. So there's still this yearning of uh going back to the old normal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, That's for sure. Let's see. Uh, we do have a question from the audience. All right. Okay. This question is from uh, Request Ventures Ken Ho. AR VR trend is setting a higher bar for many business requirements. But in your opinion, is Malaysia competitive in using AR VR in business or we are still far to go to compare with other countries? I would say um, for this itself, right, maybe sounds controversial, but um, the adoption of let's say Malaysia, for my view, may be slow. So why is it? Uh, it's because, okay, uh, it, I mean, as a business owner, right, when you think about uh, you want to cut the cost of, let's say, a training, right? Okay, right now, the things that I need to invest is, a, let's say, a Microsoft equipment, right? Let's say this Microsoft equipment costs um, 2000 US dollar, right? If you convert into our currency, it's pretty much 8000 So then you will compare, why not I just hire uh, someone, right? Someone, you know, to teach. Let's say I give a certain salary below of that uh, amount, which is to purchase HoloLens itself, and that makes my investment uh, investment worth. So I think uh, one of the things because of currency issue as well, that which actually, and second thing is that uh, cheap labels, which uh, for Malaysia business owners, I mean, or kind of old brick and mortar business, we kind of prefer it. So that, that is a certain chicken and egg issue or it's like it's a, that's another perspective for business owner there's no right and wrong it's just that when you think in business owner perspective itself it's actually much uh, more uh, workable if they just uh, get cheap currently in order to uh, not need to invest much yes they also let's say if they are afraid that if i invest so much in it what happens if nobody knows how to operate right else uh, pretty much uh, for those that uh, currently uses it, sometimes it's all using as a marketing gimmick only. It's like, hey, I have a, I have a um, HoloLens here in my uh, factory or whatsoever, right? But nobody how to operate it. So it requires um, a lot of trainings, actually. And for this thing to come, it will take time. Yeah. I think definitely for US side itself, it will be faster because things is uh, developers are there, right? So, and then they are able to exchange inside the community more uh, compared to Southeast Asia. So, if Southeast Asia or Malaysia itself uh, want to keep up with it, we need um, key opinion leaders, right? That um, we need talented uh, pools of um, engineers that build this. Yeah. So, I think that is uh, what we can currently see in the landscape. So you, 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 you touched on the careers, really, right? So what would your advice be for those who aspire to create content for AR and VR or bring AR and VR to another level, uh, like changing the technology, as we have mentioned uh, in the early part of the show that, you know, it has already uh, evolved. What are the careers available related to AR and VR? Yep, I think um for the first question is where about any advice? 
uh, for anyone to aspire to create content and let's say how do they start, right? So um, by, uh, by uh, you know, to start, they have pretty much have um, standard tools right now. And there are a lot of tutorials that are uh, available online. So they can start with the most simplest one is actually creating game. Like uh, they can create games in Unity or in Unreal Engine itself. Because I think um, that is how people actually get interested to in it. Like for instance, right, I myself, I program and code, but my I started my programming journey is also because of game. Yeah, so again, uh, although there's a lot of uh, Asian conception about games are, are bad, right? But uh, sometimes game is actually good in order for you to spark a certain interest on it, right? So, and again, back towards the pro and cons of VR, when you get addicted towards the game or get addicted towards the VR, then things may go bad. Yeah. But anyway, uh, back towards the topic itself, um, if uh, the best way to actually start is to creating games, right? Because why I said so, first thing is um, you don't need to invest uh, so much into, let's say, content because I think there are available resources, free resources that uh, is available for you to uh, right away to learn and unity itself technically there's free plan that you are able to create some uh, you are able to use it uh, right away so that is why this is the, definitely the first stepping stone for um, users to uh, get started with it and to bring it to the next level right is the toughest part so why i said so is because uh, to build a uh, very good ar and vr it requires a lot of sophic sophisticated max knowledge so why is it because of, let's say, today you see a high-class game of, um, let's say, Spider-Man, right? So let's say he is crawling towards to a building, right? He's able to see the reflection of the mirror behind of it, the reflection in the mirror. So this thing is called as raycasting uh, in, in the game world itself or even in the AR or VR. So that thing is very tough. And to reach towards to that level itself, right? It requires talent and to require talent itself uh two perspectives whether um is the uh the use i mean the developers itself is passionate enough to develop stuff i mean to um, go towards to crawl online to actually understand more or second thing itself is where um is our university is working hard so in order to produce more uh, talented or uh, uh, engineers like this so i think that <clears throat> to bring to the next level itself that is the toughest part. But do they get, get started? Yes, it's quite easy to get started with it. <coughs> and so, oh, yeah, yeah, can I continue? Yeah, uh, never mind. I think uh, just to summarize, uh, just now because you also asked uh, another question about what are careers, right? And back, yeah. uh, similar as my answer, right? Game developers is pretty much the common one uh, in order to uh, prepare with AR and VR. Um, yeah, I think, or other than that, game developers or designers or it can be like uh, e-commerce so uh, e-commerce may be another thing that uh, i see <coughs> it may be growing and to be integrated because um, right now uh, for those web developers right there are available tools like let's say if you build something uh, you want to build a website quickly there's wordpress Wix, etc right and if you want to build e-commerce site there's a shopify right and so on so um developers are all I mean, available or invited to build something that you can integrate, let's say AR technology, right? Inside um, those platform. But again, uh, as I mentioned again, uh, just back to the first question, to bring it to next level is tough. Why is because of, uh, just by looking at AR specifically, um, to build AR in Android, you will be using Upcore. Upcore technically is a, uh, Android developer platform in order to get you get started with building AR, right? Whereas for uh, Apple, you are using ArcKit, which is another SDK uh, to, uh, to build this AR itself. So these two um, SDK are currently available in each platform only, right? And you have to build an app, a mobile app to actually integrate that. You can't build a web app and integrate that. So that, that is the pain point itself. So if you want to build a web app, that has AR functionality in the sense of like, you can place this uh, furniture in your room and after that you show, uh, you point to other place, put it back and you are able to see that again. That requires mathematical skills. Um, to be more specific, we call it a SLAM, 
simultaneous localization and mapping. It's a very common mathematical model in robotics itself. So to reach to that level is tough. Yeah. Looks like we have to wrap things up. So what would your advice be for an end user who wishes to start exploring AR and VR? Start exploring in terms of using it or in terms of developing or creating content out of it? Uh, I, I would think yeah, using it, so being an end user, a consumer. I think um, for AR, technically, everyone uses it currently. Let's say you are using Facebook, right? So those that people that um, prefers to capture selfie photos, sometimes they add filter. Let's say they add a face filter, like let's say um, something of beautification as well. I think that is quite mass adopted right now. And when it comes to VR itself, is <clears throat> to adopt it, it's more like, um, let's say for those person that want to try the first time, they can just purchase a paper cardboard, which is like, is cheap and accessible. So it's just like, you can just place your phone inside there and you can just access right away. Because uh, YouTube, you are able to view it in VR. And when you are, you want a much more immersive experience, this is where you can purchase a headset specifically for VR. I think there are a lot like HTC Vive and so on. So what is the difference between a paper cardboard and this headset? It's like, it's the more immersive experience. It? Like for instance, paper cardboard, you're using a phone, right? But um, in, in a, a specific cardboard, a specific headset itself, sometimes you wear gloves. Sometimes uh, the glove detects your fingers direction and rotation etc so yeah that, that's pretty much all of it thank you so much Luis for spending your time with us in the past hour we thank you for your sharing and hope you and everyone at new books stay safe and healthy always yep hope everyone in tech doom as well as well stay safe and again i felt very humbled uh, to be able to invite that as well and i hope um today my sharing able to benefit uh, all the audiences as well all right yeah. Right. You. Thanks. That's all we have for tonight. Thank you for being with us since 8 p.m. See you again next month for another episode of Science Stream. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Good night and stay safe.